Assalamu alaikum. Hey, bache, I hope all of you are doing okay. So, in the last lecture, we studied joints. Now we are going to study some normal movements of the body. And actually, this was the first lecture that I delivered uh, to your fellow students who have joined us from May June uh, of the last year uh, of this year. But for all the new students. Please uh, memorize these things because these terms are going to come again and again in your curriculum throughout your medical life and you need to remember these. So we'll start from the basic movements and basic things and then we'll go on from there. So first of all you need to know about anatomical position. What's a, what is the anatomical position of the body? So just uh, let me show it to you. Anatomical position is when a person is standing straight with the palms in front, both uh, feet facing forward and near each other. And his arms are towards the front actually. Just let me show you just a second. So, whatever we are studying in the medical sciences. Uh, we have this thing in the back of our mind that we are looking at the anatomical position of a person. So the context of all of the organs of all of the viscera of the appendages, arm, leg, head, everything else. Whenever we discuss about that, we assume that the person is in anatomical position, normal anatomical position. And when there is a dead body that is lying in front of you or a person lying on its back, that is supine position. These positions were present uh, in the first lectures. So you can look at those ones too if you want to consult that or otherwise you can just see the anatomical position diagram that I am going to post here. Okay, but so this is the anatomical position. A person standing straight with both of the arms on the sides and the hands facing forward, palms of the hands facing forward. So, and feet are combined together facing forward. So, all of these surfaces you see now are the anterior surfaces and the back side would be posterior. So, palms of the hands are interior moreover this dorsum of the foot is interior whereas sole of the foot would be inferior or posterior and dorsum of the hands would be posterior so <coughs> now we assume the person is standing in anatomical position so let's start with different types of movements of different joints so first of all the basic movements the first movement that we're going to discuss is the flexion so normally in anatomical position a joint is at 180 degrees between two bones for example this let's take this elbow joint this upper arm and forearm they are straight so they are at 180 degrees angle to each other if you look at it that way this hinge this is a hinge joint so this hinge is straight in between the arm and the forearm and the angle that they make is 180 degrees now flexion is whenever we decrease the angle of the joint that is in respect to the 
elbow joint whenever we draw our forearm closer to our arm upper arm that would be flexion in case of this joint <coughs> joint in the leg this would be straight like that 180 degrees if we try to decrease the angle this would be flexion okay moreover hip joint it is also showing showing flexion because it it is supposed to be 180 degrees but we are decreasing the angle between the thigh and the abdomen the upper hip bone so this is hip flexion knee flexion wherever if we take it back what we do would increase the angle same is the case with this arm if we take this forearm back towards its normal position we would be increasing the angle between the arm and the forearm actually between the bones joints uh, when we talk about joints we always talk about the bones which are making the joint so we are increasing the angle of the joint that would be extension so extending the angle of the joint is extension and decreasing the angle of the joint would be flexion so we apply that here we apply that in the hand as you can see this is at 180 degrees straight if we bend it downwards we are increasing the angle it would become 270 and if we take it towards back it will be flexion but then there is a thing that is known as hyperextension hyperextension is when we are extending the angle beyond 180 degrees that is towards this side the angle would be too much increased again 270 degrees this would be hyperextension So flexion decreases the angle of a joint extension straightens and returns it to the anatomical position hyperextension is when we extend the joint beyond 180 degrees so we extended the rest then we took it back to the normal position now we are further increasing the angle that would be hyperextension if we talk about or arm extending it forwards would be increasing the angle that would be flexion after that shoulder joint we bring it back and if we try to move it backwards that would be extending hyper extending the angle more than 180 degrees so there would be hyper extension same is with the hip joint and the knee joint flexion and coming downwards or straightening it would be extension hip this is flexion and if we straighten the hip joint that would be extension hyperextension is only seen to a certain degree in the hip joint and remember in the knee joint as well as the elbow joint hyperextension cannot be seen and then abduction and adduction abduction is movement of a part away from the midline all right so if we move our arm away from our body that is towards this side that would be abduction remember b bahar ki taraf ja raha a b abduction contains b b is bahar ki taraf ja raha so that is abduction adduction is moving towards the midline or adding towards the midline so adduction is movement towards the midline so if we bring that hand back towards the midline this is the midline actually in the middle this is the midline so if we bring the hand back 
hands back towards or midline that would be adduction same is the case with the feet if we move them towards outside that would be abduction and if we move them towards inside towards the midline that would be adduction hyper abduction is when we raise arm over back or in front of the head because normally it should go till here and if we keep on extending it towards the head that would be hyper abduction because we are exceeding the 180 degree angle hyper abduction is when we cross the fingers move the fingers outward that would be hyper abduction so <clears throat> elevation as denoted by its name would be to elevate something and depression would be to bring it downwards so elevation is a movement that would raise a bone vertically as in the case of shoulders if we try to lift our shoulders that would be elevation of the shoulders mandibles are elevated during biting and clavicle during a shrug so when we are eating mandible is moves towards a word that is elevation moreover when we are shrugging moving our shoulders upward that would be elevation and depression is when we move it downward so depression is lowering the mandible or the shoulders then there is protraction and retraction protraction protraction is movement anteriorly or in the horizontal plane whereas retraction is movement posteriorly so when we are sticking out our chest or moving the hand forward that is we are moving something anterior to the or anterior plane <clears throat> thrusting the jaw forward shoulders or pelvis forward bumping our chest would be protraction whereas retraction is moving posteriorly so when we are taking or sticking out our chest we are doing protraction of the chest but retraction of the shoulders so it works like that circumduction is the movement in which one end of an appendage remains stationary while the other end makes a circular motion it is a sequence of flexion abduction extension and adductory movements so as you can see the shoulder joint is at its place while playing basketball or while catching something we tend to move our hand in 360 direction while our shoulder joint or elbow joint stay at their place so all of that is going through the disjoint that would be circumduction moreover if we try to move a shoulder 360 degrees that would be the circumduction of the shoulder joint now lateral and medial rotation rotation is a movement on longitudinal axis that is from upward towards downward we can rotate our trunk thigh head or arm and so if we try to look at the right side or left side we are rotating our head by using the lateral into axial joint same is the case with rotating our arm head or thigh now medial rotation is when we turn the bone inwards towards our midline such so is the case with this picture as you can see uh, the normal position of the hand was the anatomical position now if we rotate our arm inward <coughs> the forearm is coming in front of the chest in, in front of the abdomen this is the uh, this is a good example of medial rotation same is in this foot going on in this foot we are medially rotating it and this is internal or medial rotation and if we move it towards outside away from the midline that would be lateral rotation so medial is towards the midline midline is this line which is which can be drawn horizontally to divide the body in two equal parts so 
this line would come down from the forehead crossing on nose lips and then going downwards until this divides into one arm one leg and right side and left side equal sides so this is the midline so if we try to move any structure towards the midline it is medially <coughs> doing that motion and if we try to move it away that would be lateral rotation so i think now you get the concept of medial and lateral then there is supination or pronation it is only seen in forearm and foot supination is rotation of forearm so that the palms would face forward the anterior surface would face interiorly the so supination would be palms facing forward or inversion and abduction of foot raising the medial edge of the foot this would be supination pronation would be rotation of forearm so the palms would face backwards and aversion or abduction of foot raising the lateral edge of the foot you can look about these and uh, videos on youtube they are, they are animated small small 2 3 minute videos of each motion and from there you can understand them very easily and then let's look at movements of hand and trunk so what kind of movements can we see here we can see the flexion of the vertebral column extension hyper extension and lateral and medial flexion trunk can be rotated medially laterally head can be rotated right and left so there is right rotation of the trunk rotation of the head etc if you look at the movements of mandible there is sideways movement that is known as lateral excursion if we try to move it back towards its original position position that would be medial excursion and protraction and retraction protraction is moving forwards anteriorly and retraction would be moving towards the uh, towards its original position now let's look at movements of hand and digits there is radial flexion when we flex towards the radius or annular flexion when we flex it towards the annular abduction of fingers and adduction of fingers abduction is when we move them upwards adduction is when we move them inwards so fanning of fingers is adduction to so, fanning is abduction moving them back to the position is adduction and moving the thumb in the opposite direction to the fingers that would be abduction whereas if we touch the thumb uh with the finger and try to press that to touch the fingertips that would be opposition of thumb whereas reposition would be moving the thumb back to its original position away from the fingers movement of foot so this was a inversion and eversion inversion bending them towards inside eversion bending them towards outside then there is dorsiflexion and plantar flexion this is the plantar surface remember the downward surface sole is the plantar surface and this is the dorsum of the foot so flexing it towards the dorsum would be dorsiflexion flexing it towards the plantar surface would be plantar flexion so dorsiflexion is raising of the toes as when you swing the foot forwards to take a step also known as heel strike plantar flexion is extension of the foot so that the toes point downward as in standing on the tip toe that would be plantar flexion to remember this you just need to remember that plantar is the lower surface for the sole of the foot dorsum is the upper surface as there are palms in the hand there is plantar surface on the foot inversion inversion is a movement in which the soles are turned medially whereas eversion is where the soles are turned laterally okay so now uh, we're going to 
In this topic, let's look at the blood supply of the synovial joint, the nerve supply, and then some diseases of the synovial joint. So, the blood supply of the synovial joint is carried out by periarticular arterial plexus. There is a meshwork network of small small arteries that make a plexus there, and it is formed by the articular and epiphyseal branches, which are given off by the neighboring arteries. Uh, the arteries which are passing through there, they would give small, small articular and epiphyseal branches, uh, such as in the case of elbow joint, humeral artery, radial artery, ulnar artery, they would give off branches that would make a meshwork around the elbow joint. The capsule synovial membrane and the epiphyses are supplied by circulus uh, vasculus, uh, vasculosis. There would be an artery that would be in a uh, round shape that would go around the capsule and supply it. The articular cartilage is avascular. So the cartilage of the bones that is present on the bones in a joint does not have any blood supply. It is supplied by the synovial fluid. All of its nutrients are carried by the synovial fluid towards it. So what would happen if synovial fluid is drained or is leaked out? The articular cartilage would start dying. The nerve supply of the synovial joint. The capsule and ligaments have a rich nerve supply and they are very sensitive to pain. So any kind of damage would be very, very painful. The synovial membrane has poor nerve supply, so is relatively insensitive to pain. The outer membrane of the synovium, it is insensitive to pain, whereas the capsule and the ligaments are very sensitive to pain. Articular cartilage is non nervous, so totally insensitive. There is no nerve supply, no blood supply to the articular cartilage. Articular nerves are sensory and autonomic in nature. Now let's look at some diseases of the cerebral gland. Arthritis. Arthritis is a broad term that is used for inflammation of a joint. So inflammation and pain in a joint would be known as arthritis. Then there are different types of arthritis such as the osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is mainly seen in obese persons, in old age individuals and it results from years of joint wear. What happens is articular cartilage rubbing against each other would get soft and it would degenerate. The synovial fluid would disappear in most of the cases and when the person tries to move that joint, joint would make crackling sounds that is known as crepitus. Small, 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 just as the bubbles crackle that kind of sound would be produced in the joint when the person, uh, person is trying to move and bone spurs would develop on exposed bone tissue that would cause pain. There will be small small growths on the bone due to being rubbed against each other uh, because of absence of articular cartilage. So that would be very very painful for the person. He or she would not be able to move. It is mostly seen in obese individuals and in old age individuals such as who are more than 50, 60, 65 years old. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune attack on joint where antibodies that are formed against Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococcus pyogenes bacterial infection would go on and attack the joint and they would destroy the joint. So antibodies would attack the synovial membrane and destroy the joint until it is controlled by some medicine. The medicine used are steroids and aspirin. So steroids and aspirin are used. Now remember a remission can occur even if this disease is resolved it may the patient may get diseased again. The disease can come back.
so this was rheumatoid arthritis if you develop infection again in your later life antibodies formed would uh, can again attack your healthy tissues healthy joints then there is dislocation of the joint which is a condition where the articular cartilage Okay, so we were talking about rheumatoid arthritis and then some other conditions that are present in the joint so dislocation of a joint is a condition where the articular surface that are joining the joint surfaces that are forming the joint are abnormally displaced they are displaced from their normal position so that one surface would lose the contact completely from the other surface so if and let's suppose the joint of uh, that humerus and radius Allah in that joint humerus slips and goes downwards towards the right or left of the radius Allah and they uh, there is no contact between those that would be known as dislocation of that joint whereas subluxation F is if they are not on their normal positions but still there is a partial contact that is still retained this dislocation and subluxation is mostly seen in the shoulder joint the dislocation of a joint would lead to immense pain deformity and loss of function sprain is the severe pain in the joint that is caused by tear in its ligament so the outer ligaments which are covering the capsule if there is a tear in those ligaments it would cause immense pain in the patient that would be known as sprain but without any associated fracture or dislocation there is no fracture in the bone there is no dislocation of the joint the joint surfaces are touching each other but the ligaments are damaged mostly happens in the ankle joint or the knee joint stiffness of joints happens when uh, uh, when stiffness of joints happens joints are difficult to move because of cold weather or because of muscular spasms so it can be seen in colder regions in older individuals where there is lesser muscular mass and due to muscular spasms in some individuals the neuropathic joint <coughs> is a joint which is a result of its complete denervation so that all the reflexes are eliminated and the joint is left unproductive and very prone to damage mostly seen in <coughs> leprosy in advanced uh, um, diabetics in tebis dorsalis syphilitic patients syphilis patients etc so all of the reflexes of joints are gone and the joint is left unprotected there would be no pain in the patient even though there is swelling in the joint there would be excessive mobility and bony destruction joint would move further away from its limits and there, there would be destruction of bones mostly seen in leprosy tebis dorsalis to tebis dorsalis is the last complication of syphilis arthroplasty as a surgery by which we replace disease joint with artificial devices which are known as prosthetic joints or prosthesis so arthroplasty is a huge field these days and orthopedic surgeons they do specialties in arthroplastic then there is super specialty such as in hip joint replacement or knee joint replacement the orthopedic surgeons they are doing these things so this was it for joints tomorrow inshallah we'll start a new topic i'll let you know what it is beforehand and uh, take care inshallah see you tomorrow and sorry i did not have time to look at your presentations uh, but we're going to discuss the presentations in tomorrow's lecture i uh, reviewed some of them and most of the students they have skipped the last question that is the difference between the diabetes mellitus and diabetes insipidus they are two different diseases so
please try to study that difference and then we'll discuss about it in the next lecture tomorrow inshallah and uh, the history of diabetes was correct but we'll discuss it in more detail in tomorrow's lecture okay take care allah hafiz